one thing I haven't talked about with regard to elders is how to serve under elders. And maybe, as you think about it, maybe one of the reasons that they are prevented from being effective more often than they are, or maybe prevented from being installed more often than they are, is kind of a general lack of understanding of how that relationship even works. How do you serve it? under elders if you have them? What does that look like? And so we explore these things together in the scriptures, but I think that this is part of what it is to have uh, scriptural elders. They are, of course, responsible for all of our souls when they are installed. They're shepherds, and uh, in order for that to work, we have to be a flock. I mean, we have to be willing to serve under them. They will be of no effect if they have no ability to make decisions or if they have no ability to know you and know your circumstances. How can they be of assistance or help in the spirit if they do not know you? And very often, I think, when you hear criticisms leveled against elderships, very often anyway, you do hear that from people who don't actually know them. Well, that's not a good relationship at all. If this person is responsible for your soul, you should know them, and they should know you. And if they don't, then how is that going to work? It seems clear that you would have some complaints if they don't know you, because in order to accomplish their work, they, they do have to know you. If they're going to pray on your behalf, if they're going to help you with the material that you need in the Spirit, if they're going to provide the teachers that are necessary and the topics that are necessary, well, they, they're they going to have to know what's necessary, and in order to know that, they'll have to know what you need. No, we don't mean busy bodies or anything like that, but just how can it be that they might be of any use or service if they have no idea what's going on on the ground here? That's not how it's supposed to be. So, how to serve under elders encompasses that end of things, which is, what do we do as members of a congregation when there are elders, and what are, you know, if you will, what's in the purview of the elders? What does it mean for us to do this? So, that's what we're looking at here and talking about here, and that's where we go, uh, you know, that's working fine. To being subject. So let's start first with these admonitions in Scripture. Uh, scripture has warnings, if you will, or encouragement or admonition, which kind of means both things, for us to be subject to our elders, to our leaders. Let's look at what the Bible says about it together. Hebrews 13, 17 is the first such place in our study. Hebrews 13, 17, Obey your leaders and submit to them. They are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. All right. So first we are obeying, that is listening, um, heeding, following the instruction that we receive from them with regard to the local work, listening to the teaching because it is their job to hold the teaching soundly, according to Titus 1. So listen to that. It says obey them and submit to them. Okay, this means that's what we do. Of course, Assuming that we're not talking about sin, that the elders are not calling upon you to do something that is a sin, well, of course, you must obey God rather than men, as always. But assuming that they're acting within the realm or the scope of authority that has been granted to them, decisions in the local assembly, decisions in the conduct of the local church, well, yes, we are to obey that, submit to that. 
Why? Because they are keeping watch over our souls as those who will have to give an account. It means they're responsible to God. If, if I fall away, I'm, of course, guilty of my own sin, and I will bear the consequences for my sin. But the elders are also responsible for that. They are supposed to be watching so that people do not fall away. They are supposed to be intervening with Bible studies and prayers, discussions that may need to take place to prevent somebody from falling away, to strengthen them in their knowledge in the Lord or in their situations. Elders are supposed to have some experience in life and maybe can give some advice in addition to scriptural direction about maybe the best way to handle this or to avoid some temptation or other, which perhaps is not a binding scriptural requirement for every Christian, but is a good idea for you. I had this problem. Here's how I got away from that. They are watching, and when they give you that kind of advice, you should take it because they're trying to help you. <laughs> That's the whole point. They're giving an account. Now, that doesn't mean because one member falls away that the elders are sinful. Well, no, but they have sinned if they didn't know, if, if they had no idea there was a problem, if they haven't studied with this person, if they haven't tried to have those conversations, they haven't alerted the congregation when it becomes appropriate to do so, then they are responsible at that point because there were things that God put in place that we could and should have done to prevent the loss of a soul. And that is their job as shepherds. They are feeding the flock, but they are also protecting the flock. So how do we serve? Well, we listen when they talk with us about the scriptures. We listen when they give us advice because they are looking out for us. They might see something, especially if you are new in the faith or if you are many years younger um, or you're encountering a situation for the first time, first time parent or whatever it is, they may see things that you don't see. That's their job as elders. They're supposed to have that wisdom, that foresight, that you can borrow it. You can be wiser and smarter than you are on your own by listening to the advice of the elders. Okay, so there's that. Let them do this with joy, not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you, he said. True, if we have elders, we are not supposed to grieve them <laughs> with whatever it is, right? The generic category is called junk. But, you know, meaningless complaints, squabbles, insistence on our own way in a petty matter that is not bound by Scripture. That this is not good for us. We don't need them to be spending cycles dealing with meaningless, unimportant things. We need them to be used to the best purpose, which is for their knowledge, for their teaching, for their oversight, not for the groaning. It would be best for them, for us to do the best that we can and to listen when they give advice. There's no advantage to us making things hard on them. Because they're just people too. They're not perfect. They're not better than you. They're just the right kind of Christian at the right stage of life. This is the post. So this is why it says what it does at Hebrews 13, 17, and I think this is quite reasonable. Not that they lord things over you, that would be 1 Peter 5, but that they really do have your best interests at heart. They really may see some things that you don't see. The other thing is you might say, well, you know, this elder speaking to me, he's not older than me, or he hasn't got more experience than me. Maybe so, but two is better than one. Right, and three plus, if the elders are putting their heads together, that's going to be a much better decision 
than your own decision all by yourself. No matter how smart you are. So think of it that way too. You can lean on this as a resource. Now, 1 Peter 5. I don't know why the mouse... All right, try again. First Peter 5, 5. <clears throat> Talk about serving under them. The admonition here is likewise, you who are younger, be subject to your elders. After first having given the elders instructions for how they conduct themselves, as we mentioned earlier, he then moves on to the rest of us. The meaning of this is not young men, although that is often the translation. It's clear when you read the text that he's talking about there are the elders and there is everybody else. You, the rest of you, be subject to the elders. That's very consistent with Hebrews 13, 17. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And don't we want grace in the local congregation? I think we do. That can be yours, that can be ours, when we clothe ourselves with humility toward one another. Humility towards one another. Which is all that we've been saying so far, that, you know, be open, listen to that, consider the source. An elder should be a good source. A person who is a faithful Christian, who has been a faithful husband, a faithful father, and should therefore be a good source. Be open to that. Think about that. Be humble about that. And if we are humble in this way, in our attitude towards one another, then yes, God will grace that. Earlier in First Peter, he had said hmm, at three eight, First Peter three eight, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, a humble mind. I think that expands things in a way that you can understand. We are not intending to be adversarial to our leadership. We're not intending to treat them as the other, somebody else, not us. There's sympathy, there's brotherly love, there's a tender heart. And on either side of this, as the book ends, there is a mind. The first one is unity, the last one is Humility. Why? Well, we are in unity in the sense that we are genuinely striving for the same goal. We want to please Christ. We want to see the church grow spiritually, which means that we individually grow spiritually. We want to see the work go forward, the Lord's people and the Lord's resources to be used for the Lord's things, and effectively, actually, with strength, with justice. Shouldn't there be justice in the Church of Christ, if not anywhere else in this world? Shouldn't there be justice? Shouldn't we be justice-minded? The rest of the world doesn't know what justice is. But Christians do. So unity of mind and humble mind. So we're working together. This is part of serving. Okay. Onward and upward. Correcting elders. First Timothy 5. Yeah, this is a good part. This is where we get to get them now. <laughs> well, it's true that elders are not perfect. They're just members of the congregation. And they sometimes do wrong. This is admitted and understood in Scripture in 1 Timothy 5. 
and there are role or there are uh, rules for governing that. What do you do in that situation? In First Timothy five, let's look at these together, and then we'll come back and look at them in a bit more detail. It's 19 and uh, 20 and 21 that we are looking at here today. 1 Timothy 5, 19, Do not admit a charge against an elder, that is, don't accept an accusation against an elder, except on two or three witnesses. As for those elders who persist in sin, rebuke them, in the presence of all the elders, so that the rest may stand in fear. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I, the Apostle Paul, charge you, Timothy the Evangelist, to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. Interesting. But true, sometimes elders are accused of wrongdoing. Actually, often elders are accused of wrongdoing. But sometimes it's true, they've done wrong. So what do you do and how do you deal with this? The first thing um, that he says, okay, we go back over these. Do not admit a charge except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. So the first thing to note is that elders are open to attack by false accusation. They always are. So one of the first things that is put into place, and I see in my mind this fits hand in glove with serving under elders. One of the first things that Scripture puts in place when the rules are handed to Timothy is... Yeah, they're going to be accused, but accusations have to be verified. There have to be two or three witnesses. So this evangelist receives the instruction, you must require more than one witness. And this is, you know, it has its precedent in the law of Moses, which also required two or three witnesses before somebody was to be punished. Um... You know, why two or three? Well, because, and it's not for inaccu or, uh, imprecision. <laughs> two or three, because sometimes two people really act as one. If, say, you have a, a husband and wife, or some very close friends, or people whose interests or perspective are practically identical, you may need to have a third person. You just need... Verification is all that it's saying. Doesn't mean that a husband and wife are not valid, but just sometimes you can see that. That's why it says two or three. Sometimes you need three people because these two are almost the same witness. And that's judgment, I suppose. But I've not seen that be a problem. Um, so I wouldn't spend too much time on that, thinking about that. But really the idea with this is there, there are a couple of different meanings for the phrase two or three witnesses. Okay, I would say two. There's two different meanings here. One is literally at least two individuals who can independently testify that an elder has sinned in some matter. Okay, and that's like, it's similar to the rule in Matthew 18. When, you know, if your brother sins against you privately in some matter, some personal problem, you want to establish that that really is what happened by bringing two or three witnesses along the next time you talk to him, if you can't resolve it, right? And that's a very similar idea, so that on the testimony of these two or three witnesses, it can be escalated. If on talking to him, yes, there's a problem, and no, he's not listening to the scripture to make that problem right, then they tell it to the church. Okay, that's Matthew 18 in a nutshell. Similarly here, the two or three witnesses is literally 
independent, verifiable sources that, yes, this is in fact what happened, which allows it to move to the next stage of, all right, th we have a problem. It's time to do the next thing about this. Deal with the problem, right? The other way of looking at two or three witnesses is used um, by Paul in the second letter to Corinth, actually. If you look at 2 Corinthians 13, 1, you can see uh, he tells them, this is the third time I'm coming to you. Every word must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Which is to say, that will be three different occasions that he is there in person. And that will solidify their, their status, if you will. That will solidify their status. If it wasn't already known and as you read his letter, he gives that opportunity that maybe things have changed. But when I show up, am I going to use, you know, kind words and mercy, or am I going to use a rod? What is it going to be, Corinth? That's what Paul's saying. So his third chance, his third time there. Why do we say that? Because it may be the case that somebody who has no corroborating witnesses, says an elder did a thing. Okay, but you know we need two or three to move forward with this. Right. If somebody else comes to you, unrelated, six months later, and says an elder did a thing, and there were no other witnesses, now you start to worry about it. Especially if another person comes three months later, hey, this elder did this thing. Yeah, no. Hey, we need to talk, brother, because <laughs> you got three witnesses. See, that's how it works. There's more than one way to accomplish this. But if you can establish veracity and independence, well, that's what you need. It's not that they are to be shielded in wrongdoing or immune from accusation. It is that they are to be appropriately protected in their action. And if you think about it, it shouldn't be the case that it's hard to find witnesses. If the elders are working together, all the other elders should know exactly what this elder did or did not do. That shouldn't be hard to do. So don't think of that as immunity or a shield for them, although I know it has been used in that way before. That's not the idea. And if that is possible, that means they're not working together. They don't know, you know, left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. And that's not acceptable in the Lord. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all that the rest may stand in fear. Again, those elders who persist in sin, he said, so here comes the accusation. You don't receive it until you have established that it is true. Once it is true, on the testimony of two or three witnesses, then you take it to the elder. Take it to him. This is a sin. If they persist in that sin, then they are to be rebuked in the presence of all the other elders. That they also may stand in fear. Not in fear of you, <laughs> Timothy, in fear of God, whose church they are shepherding. If they persist in sin, then it becomes a real issue. They are rebuked. What does that mean? Well, it means they can't be elders anymore. And the other elders need to be afraid because, hey, there's a pretty high likelihood that you could have known about this. You could have stopped this. Well, they should be afraid of God. It's a serious matter to be an elder. And these are the commands. And the commands are for the evangelist. Uh, he appointed them, Titus 1, 
And uh, it looks like he removes them too sometimes. That's the way that this works. We're governed by Scripture. But rebuke them that the rest may stand in fear. Again, they're afraid of God. The evangelist is given the unhappy work of delivering this message. But that's, what else is new? <laughs> now, First Timothy 5.21, we have a very serious oath in the presence of God, of Christ Jesus, and the elect angels, which is to say something like, at the judgment day. You're taking this all the way home. You keep these rules without prejudging, without doing anything from partiality. Keep these rules. Well, my translation supplied the word rules. It's just saying keep this, guard this, maintain this. This is decorum. This is, well, it is rules. I would say rules. That's fine. But prejudging and partiality, these two words here, I, I decided to look them up. I've never studied them before, actually. So I decided to look them up and see, what is this? Because actually, when I looked at it, one of the words I knew, um, you know, but the other word, I don't think I'd ever seen that before or, or not noticed it anyway. It turns out that these words only occur in this verse in the New Testament. So the first one, prejudging, <clears throat> has a primary meaning that is not prejudging, although prejudging or judging beforehand is literally what it says. Its primary meaning is making a preliminary selection, as in, you already know who you want before you walk in there. That's what that is. We would call that prejudice or bias. You've already decided before the matter has been set before you. Somebody has been chosen, somebody is preferred, right? Like, yeah, I hear what you're saying, but let's listen to him. You know, he always has something great to say. No, that's not right at all. That's not justice. You don't do that. Before God and his throne is what the, the oath is calling upon us to enforce these things. You don't do that. You go in there, Humble, listening, right? The other word is partiality, which is leaning against or leaning towards, um, which is talking about a, an inclination, you know, but it actually is also the word for bending the knee. Genuflection. Now, ah, there's an X in there because this came from a British lexicon. <laughs> Sorry. But it's uh, genuflection, bending the knee. Do these things without prejudice and without bending the knee. What do you mean bending the knee? As in, what we mean by that is without leaning on somebody in particular. The, the verb here is inclined towards a person, be attached to that person or join that person's party. This is faction, is what he's talking about. You go in, you don't have a decision in your mind already about what has happened or who is right and who is wrong. And when you do so, you're not there to take sides. That's what this is. You're not there to take sides. You don't go in with your mind made up, and you don't go in to take sides. The only side here is the Lord's side. There is right and there is wrong, and we stand for what is right, or we don't stand at all. So there's things there to talk about. There's a lot more to talk about, and I think we don't have time, so I'm going to leave this as the end. But when we talk about serving under the elders, we are, in part, thinking about our own personal humility 
in allowing them to lead, allowing them to make decisions within the scope of their authority. But it is also the case that elders must give account for our souls, and they must give account for their own conduct. The scriptures give us rules that govern how we deal with that, but deal with that we must. It does no good to have an eldership that is divided against itself. It harms only the congregation. It does no good for somebody to be in a position of, I guess, power, but in a position uh, to know things or to say things, to enjoin things or bind things upon us, who is themselves a sinner, a person engaged in evil. No, that doesn't help anybody. That's not good at all. We don't need that. We don't want that. That is an evil ruler over a poor people. It's a hard driving rain is what that is. You don't need that. So we have to think, as I say, kind of positively and negatively. There's a balance in the scriptures, and we are trying to strike that balance in our hearts. We're willing to be subject. We're willing to accept decisions that are made. We are willing to try and cheer them along and cheer them on. Volunteer. Help where possible. Make this a joy rather than a burden for them. And yet we also are willing to say so when something is a sin, when something is wrong. That has to be done. So we'll talk, uh, we'll talk more about this again. And uh, in particular, what I wanted to look at Next was the idea of making decisions, because making decisions really is binding judgments. Binding judgments. People will say, but judgments are a matter of judgment. That is true, they are, but judgments have to be judged. A decision has to be made if the church is going to move forward. As the old managers say, pick it and stick it. I don't care which one you pick, but pick it and stick it. I'm tired of all this navel-gazing. Move. Get off the stick. Right? That's how managers talk. <laughs> but it's true. That's true. Elders need to do that. Pick it and stick it. Move. Get off the stick. Right? we got to get things done. Nobody has forever. I'm getting old. Let's do something, right? But that's the idea of binding judgments. They do have the ability to bind judgments, and I think that's where people get in trouble because they think, well, that's a matter of judgment. It doesn't have to be done that way. It is a matter of judgment. It doesn't have to be done that way, but it has to be done some way, and somebody has to make that call. Who's it going to be? It's going to be the others. They're going to make that call. So that's what I have to do? Yes, that's what you are going to do. Or you are going to be out of subjection, right? That's how it works. It's not, we're not talking about crazy things, you know? We're talking about, like, when do we meet? What time do services start? That's a judgment. Nothing in Scripture tells you what time to meet. But there will be a time, it will be picked, and it will be set, and that will be what you're accountable for. Okay, so we'll talk about that. Don't get scared, it's not that scary, but I want to set forth that no, they do actually bind judgments, and that is okay, that's their job. Part of the reason you're picking these fellas, and the qualities that lead to the person who is picked, is that they can be trusted to make those judgment calls. So we'll talk about it at another opportunity, the Lord willing. If today you are hearing these words, you're not a child of God yet, you're not a Christian, you need to become a Christian so that you can be saved from your sins, 
so that the blood of Christ can wash away every sin. And not only could you potentially be part of a congregation where people care about you, where people care about your soul, where they care about truth and they care about justice, God's justice, not social justice, whatever that is. It's probably neither social nor justice. But real justice, Bible justice, you could be part of that. They can help, we can help you in your journey. And you can have forgiveness of sins from Christ Jesus, who is the chief shepherd. He's the one who has oversight over all of our souls, and we are all subject to him. Be baptized in the name of Christ in water for the forgiveness of your sins. Name him. You'll become a Christian, a child of God. Today, if you have done those things, you are a child of God, but in some way you have not lived right, you have sinned. It's time to repent. Turn back to God. Renew your focus. But remember, God raises the dead. So you're not gone. You can come back. Things can start over. Always with God. He has that power. Your confidence is in Him. You might say, I can't do it. And that may or may not be true. Likely in the big picture, it is it is true. You can't do it alone. But God will help you. If you'll repent and you'll come to Him. As a Christian, if we can help you with our prayers, we'll do that. Either way, please let your spiritual need be known by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song Selective.